welcome to Art in the Raw. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to artist Roland Van Loon. Roland is an oil painter, and I'm your host, Ann Kelly. If this is our first time meeting, you're probably wondering who I am. In a nutshell, I am someone that's been obsessed with anything creative, art, music, and beyond most of my life. About 20 years ago, I made the decision to move to Santa Fe, New Mexico to attend art school and further immerse myself in the Santa Fe art scene. I've now been working in the professional gallery world for about 15 years now, and about halfway through 2020, I made the decision to start art in the raw. So thank you for watching today. And if you'd like to know more about me, there is an interview that I did with Len Scratch. You can find the link to that in the description. But in the meantime, I'm excited to introduce you to oil painter, Roland Van Loon. Thank you for joining us today, Roland. The first time I ever saw your artwork was that, that mural at El Farol. Nice to finally meet you. Thank you. I appreciate that. It was fun and, uh, painting it in those days. Yeah, what, what, what year do you, do you think you painted that? I know I've been seeing it for about 20 years now. Maybe 25, 20 years ago. You work primarily in oil. Do you do the occasional mural from time to time or was that mostly something you were doing for, for El Farol? Well, as a kid, I started off painting a mural with a famous artist named uh, Jean Charlot in Honolulu, Hawaii at this uh, community college called Leeward Community College. Mm -hmm. And um, he painted the foyer. It was a um, hundred feet wide and like 23 feet high. So it was, you know, I was in high school. I didn't know he was famous. I was trying to sell him a puka shell necklace. And then uh, he seemed the kind of old. He seemed kind of old to be up on a scaffold, but <laughs> I told him he needed me to help him. Mm -hmm. and anyway, so I, that's where I started off. It was a fresco mural. It's, so it's kind of like stayed with me. So I've always liked larger pieces. The, is the El Farol mural a fresco as well? I was wondering. No, it's just a mural. But basically, murals mean um, paintings on walls. The particular kind of mural that this was was called a fresco mural, which is basically painting into wet plaster with um, pigments that get soaked into the plaster as it dries and the plaster kind of whitens uh, more over time. And so the reflection of the light coming through and bouncing back off of this really um, white surface kind of makes the colors look really nice. Like, like a really beautiful watercolor almost, you know. Right, so it's actually more part of the surface as opposed to just being on the surface. I think if you were to chip into a fresco, you would see that the, the pigment probably goes in maybe a quarter of an inch, maybe half an inch into the plaster itself. I'm not the expert, Jean Charlot was. Well, and you were his apprentice. Just to do this one mural, I, I, I totally lucked out on having this yeah. opportunity. Yeah. You know, it wasn't something that I planned on, but I had ulterior motives, you know. I, <laughs> my ulterior motive was to sell puka shell necklaces. <laughs> and the lady that was working with him made the best lunches on earth. And mm. so, so that's why I like really wanted to do it to get those lunches. But in the process, uh, I had no idea that this man was of heavy caliber when he came into the art world. I was gonna you say, know? he was kind of a big deal. He hung out with Diego Rivera. I learned that you can be an artist. That was something that I wasn't quite sure about before that time. But after that time, for sure, I knew that Art was a definite direction for me. I could do it, especially since since he thought I was talented, et cetera, et cetera. It helped. Uh, I, I was going to a little class mm -hmm. uh, by a college professor named Alan Bromley. I'd seen him starting his mural, and I went to the class, and I announced it. 
I saw this guy painting a mural. And then she right away marched the whole class and said, oh, that's right. Mr. Charlot is painting his mural today. But instead of just letting my teacher take over, I climbed up the scaffold again and I said, Mr. Charlot, I brought my whole class. Isn't this cool? And I was smoking a cigar and he didn't like the cigar smoke. And uh, he asked me to get down and I basically turned it into a prank. And I said, no, I'm not gonna get down unless you let me help you paint this mural. <laughs> and, and he says, no, I, I told you already. And then I said, well, I'm not getting down unless you help me. And then finally he just went, okay, well go down in that room and ask this lady named Evelyn Giddings to find me something to do. And when I climbed down the scaffold and looked at my teacher, she looked at me and she said, you have no idea what just happened. And I went, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's how it all happened. It's such a great story. And and how long did the whole process of painting that mural take? I don't know. I think maybe like five, five, five months or something. They, these guys were really efficient and they knew what they were doing. That's definitely something I learned. When I was in 11th grade, I was student body vice president of Waianae High School. All these teachers of mine didn't like the idea that I'd be skipping class and going surfing all the time while I was in this position. And then the next year when that position was over, they really thought, we got to help this guy out. Surfing is still my true first love. But my uh, true purpose is to communicate some deeper things, how I can be a support in the world and humanity. That's kind of like what art is for me. So there's not <laughs> a lot of uh, surfing in, in New Mexico. Do you go back and visit Hawaii where you're... Where you used to live? No, or? I I I I I don't get home enough. If I ever see a body of water, which is a rare thing here in the desert. Yeah. Uh, and I see the reflections on the water surface, I, I instantly get tears and I get this emotional like inside of my lungs. It's like the tears don't all come out of my eyeballs. The tears kind of roll on the inside of my lungs and I go, oh, what am I doing? <laughs> but then um, the counter to that same thing is, is that I go, but the ocean comes to visit me like once a year. And everybody goes, really? And I go, yeah. And I go, how? And I go, with the snow clouds. And when it dumps snow on the mountain, I get to go shred and I pull out my snowboard and we tear it up because with all the nice. snow bunnies. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so yes. you are a snowboarder too. I love snowboarding and I do it you know as often as i can pick what we you know is true to us on the higher the deeper levels and so kind of always put the art world up front but you know i need things to paint about and so snowboarding and being with nature is always like a good thing but covering the alternative to the madness that's plaguing the earth was my actual original reason for being an artist i wanted to figure out what that was and um, uh, how I could use it, you know, could maybe benefit the world with it. I'm, I think I'm actually way closer than I was, but um, it's still part of a process and then discovery. And I think we need that more than ever recently. Yeah, we do. Look at the times that we're in, you know, with this pandemic and for crying out loud, the politics and everything that's going on. And then the corruption. And this is like... How do we navigate through this whole thing? What do we do? How do we, you know, what's important? The discovery I've made about this madness that we're trying to overcome is really on the inside of us. You know, through creativity, we can look at things in a different way. And art has taught me, and you know, you can have a different perspective on things. I recently was asking myself, like, so what, what constitutes happiness anyway? And so I used technology. I Googled it. Hey, <laughs> what chemicals run through your body and what, what, blah, blah, blah. anyway, it, it comes up that um, uh, there was an interview about a family that really were happy, you know, the, a man and a wife and they got four kids and they were always happy. What constituted them to be happy? And it turned out that it was a form of flexibility, you know, people being flexible and kind of bending and not being so rigid. And I looked at myself and I went, well, 
I'm kind of rigid sometimes. <laughs> and then I get this other perspective. And then I went, I'm going to be more flexible. And all of a sudden, I visualized this coconut tree and how it was flexible. And then during a the hurricane, it can kind of bend over and all that. And then I went, I want to be like a coconut tree. It survived. How, you know, it survived. So in, in this creative way, then I'm able to take the information and like paint in a more flexible way. And like, do I have to just stick to this way that I do it? Or can I experiment? Can I be more loose? And anyway, so this is how this, um, this ties into discovering an alternative, you know, and we can do it with our creativity. We just, I just did a cement counter, for instance, right? I, I was watching the guy that was helping me, uh, Todd from La Puntia, comes over, help me out. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, aren't you going to hard trowel it? Because that's how the plasters in Santa Fe do it. They do hard trowel plaster, it makes it glass smooth. And then you put Ocon over, it makes a really nice glass finished wall. Beautiful. I thought, well, when are you going to hard trowel it? When are you going to hard trowel it? And he goes, well, he says to me, you know, if you hard trowel it, it's just going to be all gray. It's just going to look like a, just a blase gray smooth thing. He goes, that's not how I do it. He has these diamond um, sanding pads that he mm -hmm. sands it afterwards and he smooths it out. And, and I ask him, so can that diamond pad like sand through the rocks and everything? He goes, yeah, we'll sand the rock smooth. And all of a sudden I could see it. I go, oh man, that's, so this thing's surface is going to have all these different textures and all that kind of stuff. Boom, well, my whole world just like changed with cement. Now I want to like go sand cement and I want to find all these cool textures in it. So the creative world is about like discovering other ways of seeing discovering other ways of doing things, putting it together and having a fusion about like, like how you live your life. And sometimes you're able to like go, I should live my life like the way I've made that cement counter. I'll just sand that layer off and it'll look better than <laughs> maybe get the way it is. You know, things like that is like metaphors, is like lessons of life. And so that's what's cool about it. That's kind of like what painting here in New Mexico is like. There's this, all these really rich like things in New Mexico that people don't know about. Like El Faro. Mm -hmm. Everybody thinks like the oldest buildings in the country are like on the East Coast. The oldest buildings are in Santa Fe, New Mexico. That's people right. don't know right. these little things. And then They're the oldest capital. And I think El Faro oldest. is the oldest bar in oldest cantina in the country. Yeah. 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 And, oh. and for that alone, I'm like totally, I, I totally relish that I have a mural on that wall all amongst, and I'm in good company with other artists, you know, like Alfred Morang and William Vincent. He's got a mural in there. A buddy of mine, uh, Stan Natchez, has a mural okay. over there. And <laughs> I'm all about the stories. So, what if I pull up your website and you tell us some stories about? Some okay. Stories? Does that sound? Good. Sounds good. I'll tell you a story about any of these paintings. Sure. This is Roland's website. Clearly from the Santa Fe Plaza. The building is the bandstand at the center of our city, the Santa Fe bandstand. I wanted the building to kind of almost look like a flying saucer because we have Los Alamos nearby. And there's all these extraterrestrial things that everybody's been trying to hide. Well, I know it's really like the bandstand, right? It's all happening there and uh, in the light of it all. But if you look around, um, I have this bull smelling a rose, right? And so basically the bull represents the Spanish culture in Santa Fe, meaning Spanish people from Spain, their descendants, like all the the, like a lot of the names that the streets are named after, et cetera, et cetera. And then if you look on the left side, you'll see the skeleton kind of dancing. And then he's like the Mexican part of uh, uh, Santa Fe. He's the guys that come across the border, look for jobs. And then right next to the skeleton, you'll see this like a Virgin Mary. But if you look at her, she's got a brown face. and. Uh, she is Our Lady Guadalupe, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the 
the female divinity of the city that um, that emulates um, like total acceptance of people of color. Our city is a santuario, a sanctuary. All these guys that come across the border can come to Santa Fe or New Mexico and they'll be safe. They're not just going to get arrested by ISIS and boom, and throw you in jail. People here try to get help them become citizens, and which is a really cool thing about this city. And okay, and then right in between the skeleton and our our lady, you have this cowboy guy, but he's got green cowboy boots. And that's really the, that's all these guys that come from the East Coast that have thought about wanting to be a cowboy, but they just can't get away from their ostrich boots and all this stuff. They're like, they're real, they, they look like cowboys. They really haven't lassoed a, a cow at all. And you have uh, Our Lady Gaga. This is my depiction of her. I didn't really see her. I just imagined her here. Because you have, there's this movie destination place that Santa Fe is in. And that's just the beginning of a little bit of like what my painting is about. It just includes a lot of different kind of cultures and kind of a lot of different mix. So if you look at the guy in the very front with the blondie and the hat, he's got a Aloha shirt. Well, guess what? Like even people from Hawaii are here and uh, and it's because there's such an eclectic mix of, you know, and what and what, you know, what brings us all together, you know? It's really the art. Art is way bigger than you start off thinking. Like I thought, oh, I'm a painter and there's paintings, but there's art in dancing, there's art in pottery, there's art in the architecture, the more so the, the bandstand looking kind of like a flying saucer. It's sort of this vortex for the, for the spacecraft just to come here and it'd be the first place to land and kind of figure out what are all these people doing over here. Anyway, I, that's why, I, that's what this story of this painting is, is just bunch of different things and if you look at the children the children those are my children i put them in basically all of my paintings but i put my children as they grow this idea of growth is something that i also think about a lot we're not just stagnant beings i'm getting older but am i actually getting older really what i, I really attribute is, is that I've just been growing like a tree. Everything in the art to me is alive and it has the possibility to continue growing. That's what that painting is about. And this happens in the summer. Mm -hmm. So it's warm. It's a great event. It's like one of the best things about Santa Fe to actually be able to dance at the Santa Fe bandstand during the summer. It is the funnest thing. I, anyway. I can't wait to do it again. Honestly, of all of the things that I miss, it's yeah. all of the great outdoor concerts that we have in Santa Fe, the, the downtown yeah. bandstand and the rail yard shows. Yeah. I don't know. And then the other it. thing, if you notice in my painting, mm -hmm. you know, you have all different kinds of people from all different races. It's a melting pot, like Hawaii is a melting pot. And I like that about this place. Very Santa Fe. So out of curiosity, why, why did you pick Santa Fe when you decided to relocate? I'd heard about this place. I'd never really been here. I, I won the Ford Foundation traveling grant while I was in college, and it allowed me to do some traveling. So I got to see some things. I won't say I saw everything, but I did dedicate every day to see a different museum. I ended up going to Europe, and I could like get a Eurorail pass. I could sleep on a train and be in a different city every day you know, in my travels. And then I'd go to these different cities and look at art. But I actually didn't like cities that much. Mm -hmm. And even though I had these romantic ideas about being in the city, like being in New York or being in an LA or being in Paris, I didn't want to completely give up nature. Even though I traded ocean for a different kind of nature, Santa Fe is actually the way old Hawaii really the laws around protecting the land actually were. There aren't a whole bunch of high rises here, for instance. There's a mountain and there is a lot of art. You can't meet people really outside of art. So they're either framing art, photographing art, shipping art, 
everybody's related to it somehow. Waiters like wait tables and go, art artists, you know, they make jewelry here. It's just, the city is just like full of like amazing things. And I happen to have a lot of like Native American friends that live on the Pueblos. I, I actually have the opportunity to experience a lot of that as, here as well, which is beautiful. All the feast days and all the dances. So so diverse, you know? The Spanish people are super cool too. You know, all their music and flamenco. Yeah, we haven't even hit on that subject. I was like gonna flamenco. say, that's, that's been a huge influence for you. And it almost totally. feels like maybe these, these mermaids are doing flamenco dancing well, they, underwater. They are they, are yeah, they? And, okay. Yeah. So basically this painting, I decided to paint everything I love. Like, like everything I loved. And then I had the idea when I was on the uh, West Coast. So mm -hmm. so there's a little town over there that painted really cute. Well, it's a town called Capitola. And I go over there and have coffee on this. And I look down at these buildings. I love these colored buildings. And basically, that whale was a mural on, on a store in Capitola. And I photographed it. I love that way that artist like made the whale he put barnacles on it and i said oh, i can just make it my own and then seal was a sign in the parking lot and i went wow somebody really knew seals way better than me <laughs> and but octopus i really know i've eaten a lot of them i speared them the middle mermaid is actually my son's partner her name is rain and she makes shell jewelry in hawaii she sells the shell jewelry. So I put this crown on her. The Black Mermaid, when these guys got killed this year by policemen and they, all the people that this happened to, and I thought to myself, I really need to make a statement. And so I included her as a mermaid because I don't see that many Black mermaids underwater. And I love people and I, I feel like this is something that I could bring a different view of this stuff that's going on in our time. And then the other mermaid is a beautiful Hawaiian woman with her hakule. I kind of had to mix it up. My Hawaiian mermaid is, is actually doing flamenco. Because <laughs> 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 Tahitian shimi and flamenco have the same, like a lot of the same power, female power. Yeah, so this painting is about everything that I love related to the ocean. And uh, if you look, closer at my painting with the lights coming down you'll mm -hmm. see little stars and so i'm connecting the light as the light from the universe that comes all the way into our ocean and you know there's like really special things about the ocean we need to protect we really need to take care of it right now it's important so this is part of like the cause that i feel with my art is like if somehow i can get people to open up their hearts to the ocean and mermaids and the, basically then an open heart to me is really the place where where we are going to make some change you know so that's what i'm kind of trying to do the painting without being completely foo-foo about it yeah <laughs> and no, so beautiful. you've even got that bird that seems to have swooped down for some dinner maybe he's a pelican yes another yeah. thing I love pelicans. Don't you love pelicans? How do you not? There's, there's how do you not love these things? You know, sea turtles. Mm -hmm. You know, you love them. Dolphins. You love them. You know, just and anyway. So this is everything that I love in this painting. And yes, I actually have a clam shell that big, and I love shells, and mm -hmm. I have a bunch of them in my house here in New Mexico. I love that, and and this is a pretty big painting right? yeah it's, yeah it's uh it's 54 inches by 72 inches this painting has evolved over time i have a buddy that's a, a famous artist well known or however you want to say it but his name is tony abeda i have coffee with him in the morning and mm -hmm. he's been uh prompting me he, he says i got a good eye you know it'll make your paintings really cool like the focus like on, on depth a little bit more and so from his uh, influence i'm really trying to create this depth so that you can 
kind of go into the painting a little bit more. And anyway, one of my favorite artists was Picasso, and he used to have his apprentices paint some of the same exact paintings that he did that he liked, and he'd have like five different exact same paintings. And the reason is is because there are departure places in paintings. You could keep going to the left with it, or you could actually shift it and go to the right. And so he'd he'd like develop the same paintings and go all these different directions with the paintings. So actually, fortunately for me, I don't have to do all of that because right now with this digital photography and all the things, I can look at it and I can repaint my paintings and I can get ideas. I can depart them in a different direction. So like like for instance, this this one, right? When I first saw Flamenco, I kind of asked, like, where does this dance and where does this music come from? And then I heard it came from the Moors, all these gypsies come go, living back in those days. As I learned more about Flamenco later on, I found out there are these famous Flamenco dancers like Carmen Amaya, who is called Queen of the Gypsies. The first time that I heard the um, music and I saw the dance, I right away got up out of my chair. You know, I wanted to give them money, but the person I was with said, no, 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 don't give them money. But so then I started clapping and I started saying bravo and all. And it actually seeing the flamenco show, I'd been in Santa Fe for a couple years already, but I never saw a flamenco show. I was actually ready to go home back to Hawaii. I decided to stay because I wanted to paint this thing that I saw. Mm. And, um, Part of what I realized was is there was an invisible thing that I wanted to paint, but I didn't know how. When I realized that flamenco was really old music, like super old, like hundreds of years old, that these gypsies sang and they danced to, and that people continued this tradition into the nowadays, I thought to myself, whoever wrote all this music must be rolling over in their grave since they're still dancing this. So I thought about how would I draw the person that wrote the music and the original people. And so I decided that I was gonna make them a skeleton, the spirit, right? The, it was an ancestor that had written the music. Little did I know that Mexican people had been doing something similar in their art and they have a celebration, you know, celebrating the Day of the Dead once a year. But I kind of heard it from a different angle and I listened to the music. But then I was in Santa Fe and so I didn't want anybody that was looking at my painting to confuse it for being a flamenco scene in maybe Mexico or anywhere else. So I put a curtain around the scene, which has Indian blanket designs. Mm. Um, and I, so nobody could mistake that this was a Santa Fe scene. And so, so place became important. And the place where it was happening was El Faro, a lot of these flamenco shows. So what does El Faro mean in Spanish? You know, it's like, it means the light, the lantern. So, so I made the owner, that guy there that's holding the lantern, his name is David Solovar, and he's holding this lantern. Mm -hmm. so, then, so then I thought, so what's the heart of these people? And I realized that both the Indians or Native Americans and the Spanish people had an affinity for this Lady Guadalupe. Some Indian guy in Mexico side had the vision. His name was Diego. And he had this first visitation of Lady Guadalupe. He saw it first. Across the board, the Spanish people and the native people kind of were able to connect through this being, saint. So I thought, gee, you know, how do I put her in the painting? And so basically I call this Our Ladies at El Faro because the reference to Lady Guadalupe is Our Lady. And, I, and then people like do things like, like want to draw Lady Guadalupe in a bikini and it's like sacrilegious. There's like almost no respect to this, this divinity, this thing that people really revere is special here. But that's not what I'm doing, you know, with my painting. I, I, I put her presence in my painting along with 
the skeleton and the lantern and this umbrella to kind of give my audience an idea and have a memory of this place because it's special and not a blind optimist. I see all kinds of stuff out in the world that doesn't work for me. I tend to focus on um, the more positive things like celebration. And I definitely love to dance myself. So it's just part of what comes out in the expression. And you're into salsa dancing too. Is that, is that right? Come on. I'm a salsa dancer girl. <laughs> <laughs> so, so where do you use it so for, for salsa dancing? It changes over the years. I have a buddy. His <laughs> name is Carlos Mora. And I never knew he was a dance teacher, for instance. And so, you know, all the different dance places that one night or maybe two nights a week host like salsa music, but it's not all the time. There was a time in Santa Fe, I tell you, it was so awesome. But you could go on a Thursday night to El Faro, you would have the Manzanale brothers. And then you could go on Friday night to El Faro, and they would have the Soul Deacons, and then on Saturday night, you'd, you'd have no Nosotros. You know, it seemed like life was, could it be more perfect? Over time, the places changed. So, so nowadays, you have some dancing at La Fonda Hotel. Things have been changing, and there's just not quite as much dancing going on, especially now with the pandemic. I it's, have it's a kind of, feeling that when this is over, the pandemic stuff, there's going to be so much dancing. We will be dancing everywhere. I really hope so. Dancers are like surfers. We just sit around waiting for a surf or a big swell to come in. Salsa dancing is to surfers like waves are. You know, we're just waiting for the time that we can do it. And we're all biting at the bit, I think. Yeah. I know I am. I can't speak for everybody, but mm -hmm. okay. So I have a Taurus moon. I'm kind yep. of into astrology. I like yep. it. So I'm a Gemini with a Leo rising and a Taurus moon. And for some reason, I started painting bulls. I always told people that the bull is really the disguise I put on when I go out. You know, but I was into the bull for a while. The bull is a powerful animal. A lot of people depict the bull in the way where they're trying to conquer the bull, kill the bull with bull fighting and all that. There's a story about a bull that's actually a really nice bull. He happens to be blue. I forgot his name, but the Spanish people tell this story. But the bull, like, smells flowers. It's a happy bull. He's actually a nice bull. My depiction uh, is really the, the nice part of the bull that likes to dance, and but still powerful. He's a nice bull, but he's a fluid bull, right? When you dance, there's a nice component to dancing. There's someone that's leading and there's someone that's following. That's, I, I call it a nice component because it kind of can be a metaphor for life. So the way that I like to dance is... Uh, Basically, the way I got taught, my conditioning is men lead. If the if the mu if you like mess up on the dance, it's the guy's fault because he couldn't lead. There's this a little bit of a pride that take into the dance floor, like and there's so many people that dance here. The girls can be kind of snobby sometimes and go, "Do you know how to salsa dance? Can you lead?" And then you have. I used to lie and say, "Oh yeah, I could do it." But but then you maybe only dance with them one time, and then next time you go, hey, you want to dance? Nobody wants to dance with you. So, yeah, I've invested in um, the dance world. I've taken dance lessons, and I've had, like, a dance teacher live with me, and I got to learn how. I get the privilege of having most beautiful dancers I get to dance with. The muse, you know, I love her. Brings a lot to the art. It's that uh, race car drivers, they say it, like the agony and the ecstasy, you know, it's all of it together as one. You can't just have one without the other. It's the good and the bad, the light and the dark, the contrast. Well, that's life, it's, right? Everything. I love it. All kind of, it's yeah. like 
what else do you want? <laughs> exactly. I don't know. I guess I guess you could want money and all of that, but you know, there's yeah. prosperity and then there's abundance. And um, I have a lot of abundance. I, you know, my world is abundant. I have lots of great friends. I have great conversations. I get to dance, get to what, shred. What more, what more do we want? A few weeks ago, I interviewed my friend Daniel and he's been photographing bullfights for a few years now. Wow. And, and he's Portuguese Canadian. He lives in California now, so he's been photographing all the bloodless bullfights, but he's also traveled to photograph the more traditional bullfights. Okay. And one of the things I thought was interesting when I was talking to him in regards to the bloodless bullfights is, okay, so they do that because it's um, friendlier to the bull, but the matadors, I mean, the bulls don't know it's a bloodless bullfight. I mean, I think just what struck me about it was just the level of, of passion that these matadors had for the bullfighting. I don't know how to explain it other than just next level of just, you know, why does anybody do anything? Um, why, why do you paint? Why do these guys fight these bulls? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I had I'd showed him your bull dancing painting, but he was really inspired by it. But I think kind of on a, from a different perspective. What, what was his twist? He kind of perceived it as, as the dance between the bullfighter and, and the bull. And Interesting. It's kind of a similar thing that I feel like about the painting. Like mm -hmm. I feel a similar thing. I, I call it passion and desire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and so the desire is the woman and then the, and the bull has this passion and the two make a dance. Passion and desire constantly facing each other, create this movement in the dance. So especially if they're not killing the bull, when they're killing the bull, it's almost like intelligence can conquer uh, the beast. But when you'd say that they're not killing the bull and then they're doing it, then it, then what's going on? Then it's about a, a dance with this powerful thing that that we maybe like misunderstand and we kill, but now with a higher level of understanding, we have compassion. And so yeah. we don't kill it, but we dance with it instead, you know, on a matador of all the guys, male, they're totally gracious and they have such control. They trust their techniques and it takes a lot of training. So mm -hmm. I, I, I could see the interpretation of this this friend of yours with my painting for sure. The more I do these shows, I keep finding all of these these connections and I kind of can't help but share them. So I'll, I'll definitely- It's interesting, See, that's part of the story. Exactly, it's becoming yeah. this, this larger story. Art for me in some way is kind of like, this word evolution really means that things are alive mm -hmm. and they keep growing, expanding until we're at the point to maybe interpret them and get the real meaning and the messages from these things on a level that is universal. And so that's kind of what my plight as an artist is, is to kind of discover what that is. And I inch by inch plug along and get these things. When I was really young, I thought it was about talent and all of that. Well has a lot less to do with talent. It still has a lot to do with talent, don't get me wrong, but it has a lot less to do with talent than it has to do with lifestyle. This create, creative thing that we're trying to be part of is actually the thing we have to be. And it's in everything that we do. It's in, it's in the way that we cook. It's the way we raise our kids. It's the way we socialize. It's the way we interpret the world. The way you make countertops when the way you make countertops and get all turned on about a, a new discovery and like yeah. you mean this could happen you know there's all kinds of information out there about how the mind works like ted talks on the mind works wow, it's incredible like stuff you know but yeah if you're if you listen to all that you constantly just keep growing with more information and then you know a lot of people are traumatized and a lot of people have issues from the past and all that. And then creativity and a change of perspective has a way to like 
address all that as well. It's just amazing. So That's I think I'm is. really in it for my own mental health. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I think I think art is great therapy and and not just for the making of it but sometimes the viewer and I mean it's also just really transformative as well the more I take close to my creative side the more I feel like I'm connected to the universe and that the universe takes care of me a thing that I try to do as much as I possibly can is I use this word called kokua that is a Hawaiian word which means to help out without any like ulterior motives for for my own self gain or you help out because the land does better you know you help clean up the garden because the garden will have more fruit and we all like cocoa help out it, it, it can be kind of a funny thing to say as well but it's like, hey, cocoa. You go, no, that's not cocoa. You have to pay now, bro. <laughs> you know, but, uh, uh, not this know. time. <laughs> not this time. But I like, I like, I like the principles of cocoa to just do it because it's the right thing to do. I definitely don't paint to make money. I don't look around and go, if I paint that, I could sell this for so much money because everybody wants this, et cetera. So I do not paint that way. I paint because I really feel like this is what I'm supposed to be doing with my time. Mm -hmm. And this painting is really important. And, and the things that are really important to me is this really the things I love. I love dancing, and so I paint about that. I love flamenco, and I love, I'll love i paint that. It's a subject matter I love to paint. And I got to know the people, and I, I think some of that energy you go into the painting with sort of gets translated. Or yeah, if you're painting, if you're depicting something in your artwork that you're passionate about, people are going to see it. They're going to feel it. Not everybody <laughs> will, but a lot of people feel it. Yeah, yeah. one of the things that really fascinates me about art making is most so many artists. I mean, you're you're making it literally because you basically you can't help it. So when you start painting something, you're not painting it because Mr. Black said he'd give you five thousand bucks. You just woke up and you were just ready to paint. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly how it goes. It's like a crapshoot. So wherever the dice land, that's where the dice land. And in, in advance, I know it can be feast or famine, but when it's feast, oh my goodness, it's a feast. You know, it's really, yeah. really amazing. For instance, um, the uh, Spanish colonial part of the Folk Art Museum did a, an exhibit called Flamenco from Spain to New Mexico. I was actually asked if I wanted a couple of walls in the show for a couple of paintings. Went to the opening and I met all the townspeople in all their tuxedos and I met all the musicians that played flamenco guitar and I met some of the dancers. Nicolasa Chavez, she's the curator of the Spanish colonial section, and she's a flamenco dancer. And anyway, she saw my mural at El Faro, and 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 I asked her like, "Oh, why? You, why are you telling me that?" And she says, "Oh, I had so many cultural references," mm -hmm. and and then she brought up the bull and Spain, and that the skeleton is really kind of Mexican, and there was like an eclectic. A presentation of the culture here in a flamenco world. I'm not a history teacher, but the way that it really goes is gypsies migrated and then the Spanish took on because because Spain is really warm and so the gypsies liked it where it was warm and they danced in the street. And then there was a, a fusion. Spanish people started dancing and kind of claiming it as their own dance. But you know, it really is a dance from the gypsies and not all Spanish people were gypsies. It's a fusion. I don't know, man, the Yeri Japanese food and they got this sushi, but now they have like red chili and <laughs> sushi and just trying new herbs. And, well, and I love places. sushi and I, I've lived in New Mexico long enough, <laughs> but I've definitely had sushi with New Mexico flair. Yeah. I kind of thought that was just because I lived here. 
Oh, I don't know. People I don't know. are just mix. People are just mixing different things and putting them together. You know, and uh, I think this idea of a melting pot, you know, is becoming more so with the internet and yeah. Google and all these things and Facebook. You can't help but have a fusion. You can't just go. I am this kind of a person and this is the way I am. When you're being influenced all the time with everything, how are you going to just stay rigid? You got to be flexible. And then, yeah. you know, yeah. this flexibility brings us happiness. And so when we have that fusion, then that's cool. So it's easy to like all different kinds of food now. I mean, you can eat African food at Jumbo's or you can eat like the Spanish cuisine, you know, high end at La Boca. And then you can like, you know, have barbecue things and the cowgirl. You can have Thai food. You can have all kinds of things. So do you have to just say, I only eat fish? Come no. on, man. Try it. Try it. You might like That's it. boring. <laughs> do you have a yeah. favorite kind of food? My favorite food is always going to be raw fish and poi. Sardines and poi. Poi. poi is probably my favorite food to eat. If I go and pick two foods to eat, I would eat a poi and raw fish that's like my favorite thing to eat mm -hmm. and then if my second would be poi and fried fish and then the next thing I, I would say I really like you know my green chili and I love you know I love green but I really like red a lot and so I love my red the most well and it depends on which restaurant you're at too in Santa Fe what's that one on the corner of fifth street and surreal's um uh, the pantry. Oh, pantry, yes. I like their red. To me, that that is like really like local style food. After that, to me, it would be Maria's, and then La Chosa. Tomasitos are maybe fourth. If I'm at Tia Sofia's, definitely the green chili. Tia Sofia's is like my favorite local breakfast thing on Sundays. It's a must. And I like to go to La Fonda and go eat over there just because I like to look at the stained glass windows and, uh, at, at the La Fonda Hotel. You know, all those, the, the painted windows, not stained glass, the oh, hand yeah, painted yeah, windows yeah. that are all around. I mean, this is little things. No, it's the little details. And you can go up to the bell tower and watch the sunset. You can watch the sunset. Thank you. I like Tune Up, and mm -hmm. I really like the owner. His name is Jesus. Pasquals. I mean, you can go on and on about all the really cool places to eat. Um, Santa, Santa Fe is definitely a food town. It's not just an art town. It's a food town, too. Well, see, this is where art and food kind of meet. Food, art, and dance meet here in Santa Fe. It becomes a little triangle. It's all kinds of dance. So you have all the native guys doing their dances, Spanish people with their flamenco and their salsas. And then you got your two-steppers. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I'm curious, you, you've mentioned flamenco being a big influence and being into salsa. What other types of music are, are you into? Do you listen to music when you're painting? Actually, I'm the complete opposite. I'm one of those people that uh -huh. I go into the silence. You're a and silent so, painter, yeah. Yeah, I go into the silence and I'm actually kind of, when it comes to my creative world, I'm actually a loner. I'm a loner, I'm alone. So that Leo rising that I have mm -hmm. is like the stealth bomber i'm kind of out in the forest hidden in the i don't really come out in the open yeah. but when it comes to music i definitely come out i come out and the other side of the leo uh, rising thing comes out the personality hey, look at me i'm here it's a whole public persona but in my creative world I, li I like to just be in this like total quiet box I, that's just something I often ask. If I turn on music, I actually want to start dancing and I stop painting and I don't feel like painting. I mean, why would you paint when all this great music's on? You want to go dance. And, and your brush you strokes know, are a little different. You're <laughs> yeah, or it would be like being in someone's kitchen and you smell them cooking. Who cares about this painting? You want to go see what they're cooking. Right. It's like a distraction for me. Otherwise, the time that I have painting is kind of important to me because I have so many other responsibilities as a parent, you know, 
just all the things. But so the painting time ends up being like really special. And so I kind of almost treat it like uh, maybe like going to church. I don't go to church. Sounds like that is your church. It's kind of like the place where um, I feel like I connect with the creative spirit. Because <laughs> where does all the creativity really come from? I mean, yeah. it kind of comes from your head and you think about things, but then this dexterity and the connection and the way you're able to do it is like, wow, this is actually kind of amazing. It's, it's developed over time. I, I couldn't always paint the way that I do. Sure. I, I, you know, by sticking with it over time, just gotten more control, more more understanding about what the process is. You know, I've got some good people I bounce ideas off. Like my buddy, Tony, you know, he's really cool. Yeah. And I have a different twist on like wh what the importance of it is and why. Like for instance, he was saying, man, I've just done all these landscapes. He goes, but what if one day there wasn't a landscape to paint? What if the world has changed? Wouldn't this actually have been more meaningful? And here he's doing it. I go, never thought of it like that. But now in this pandemic, I never understood why my paintings of all these dance scenes that I did, all these people having joy and having all this fun and all that. What's the importance to it? Well, guess what? As soon as you can't do it, right? you go, wow, that was really important. Mm -hmm. I'm sure glad I did it after all. You know, you can't really try to think, overthink like why you're doing what you're doing. You just gotta, you just gotta be true to yourself, you know? Yeah. And, and then I think if you're true to yourself and you can, you know, just accept certain things about yourself, like, oh, okay, uh, I don't like listening to music. I don't have to listen to music. And you go, hey, that's okay. Just yeah. because, just because all my other friends do. <laughs> right. Know? No. So what? No. But I can actually socialize while I'm painting. So I don't mind people coming to visit me. I love it. Mm -hmm. You know, I can sit there and I have conversations and I can engage with other people and paint. But I, you know, but I just go, I love having you here, but I'm just going to keep painting if that's cool with you. Yeah. I, do. I like, I like my meditation time. Working with your breath and being able to meditate is a, is a powerful tool that, to start your day with. And so I roll out of bed and every morning I, I sit and then I just focus on my breathing and I meditate for 20 to 30 minutes every morning. I guess take this principles of uh, meditation into my painting. Just kind of let it come from somewhere else. Not so literal, sort of from your gut, your inspiration. Yeah, your inspiration, your own intuition, just. Yeah, your own intuition. So I'm curious, do you, do you collect art by other artists? I, I, I like to be like a treasure hunter. I like looking for things and i like the unusual way that i might discover them or find them biggest art collection has to do with polynesian tapas I collect like wood bark pounded fabric with paintings done with stencils and this kind of thing hawaiian style stuff you know tahitian style someone i like all the tapas and you know like i collect that i like collecting you know I guess weird like artifacts. I really like old fish hooks. And I really love having uh, little things. I don't need like a big painting, but my friend Erin, the artist here in town, she gave me a little drawing. I, I treasure it. It's less about like how important the art is, but my connection to the people that I get the art from. I, I, I would love to have a cool etching by Picasso, uh, that is something I really like to have. One of the silk screens by uh, Andy Warhol. I'd like to have that. I don't have them yet, but I can see myself having those those particular things. The problem is you can like load up your world with all kinds of stuff, you know? And right now I only really have room for the stuff that I'm making myself right now. And then I really don't have all the room to put everybody else's things in. I'm more of a producer. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make too much sense to be a producer and a collector all at the same time. It's like um, you're you're, you're be buried alive in all the <laughs> things people make. Well, you so. just got to be selective about what those things are. I'm wondering, 
if you have any advice for, for young artists? From all the research that I've done about the way the mind works is, is that if there's something you want to do and you really want to do, it's possible. You, want, you should do things for the right reason. Put your priorities together because there's other levels that are have more value than the money that you might make. And you, and you can still make money. I think so many people put the focus on that. I think changing the order and finding an actual purpose or like a connection to your, your life purpose. And if it happens to be an artist and, and you do that, there's rewards for having courage to follow what you feel like your purpose is. I think that that's definitely true. There's satisfaction in knowing that you're doing the right thing for yourself. And then I would say that the myth of everybody being a starving artist is just a myth. It's not, it's not true. I might not have had paintings that sold for high digit numbers, but what I have had the experience of is lots of people buying paintings from me and people loving it. Man, I meet the most amazing people. If I didn't pursue this gift of art that was presented to me, I would never have discovered that I didn't have to do things like the way I was told I had to do them. I was told, oh, work hard and go do this every day and da 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 It helped me. I, 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 don't get me wrong. I, I'm punctual and I, I love all that. I love c creating and I, I don't mind working. You know, I do, I do lots of things. But, but when it actually comes to the quality in my life, it really comes from this other stuff, you know, it's people that I'm around. That's really where my abundance is. My abundance is in the friendships that I have. Right. You wouldn't have been involved in that mural if you hadn't just gone, gone for it. it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my mother was an artist. I saw this. I saw this old man. Uh, I really loved my grandfather growing up. I really admired him. I think because I admired my grandfather so much, you know? I mean, I was taught to get up off my chair and if the older person got on the bus, let yeah. them sit down. Yeah. The same thing with the ladies, you know, that's the way I was taught. You know, meeting him, this older man, it was my job. Uh, my job is to respect my elder. It really wasn't self-serving. It was like, I wanna help you. And it wasn't anything for me. I was like, what can I do to help you? Right. You know, I'll clean your brushes, I'll sweep your floor, I just want to be around. <laughs> okay, this is a funny part of the story. So, I was a volunteer for about three weeks. Two or three weeks went by and they go, well, we have something to tell you. We don't want your volunteer help anymore. Oh. When they told me that, I started to cry. And they looked at me and he goes, oh no, that's not what we meant. We're going to put you on the payroll. I was like, oh, you're going to put me on the payroll. Oh, cool. He says, yeah, tomorrow the newspaper is going to come and photograph us painting on a mural. I go, well, I don't know how to paint. He says, don't worry. We got you covered. We're going to give you a cup of water and a paintbrush. You just paint water on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and they were all painting, and I was painting water on the wall. It was just like, that's so awesome. So that's really how I started, painting water on the wall, because I didn't know how to paint. Uh, got to start somewhere. <laughs> you had to start somewhere, so I'm just painting water on the wall. And so that's how life has been for me. Because I work for this artist, what I know for doggone sure is um, me staying close to my art is I'm going to be at the right place at the end of my life because I'm never going to live forever and I am going to go. But when I'm going to go, I'm going to be able to go, hey, man, you know, I did what I wanted to do. And this is where it's taken me. See where the journey goes. And I'm a Gemini and I love adventure and I love traveling. And I think part of my travel isn't just places like a Sagittarian's places far away, this and that. But my place is in my community. I travel in my community. I know the waiter. I know the chef. I know the dishwasher, you know, as I'm walking through the restaurant. And I like to go in through the back door. I don't need to be like a Scorpio where I <laughs> dive off a plane and land on the ground, you know, off my parachute in a, in a concert for everybody to see. 
you know, I like the back. I like to go to the back. I like to know what all everybody. I like all the, you know, and I really love people. What you see a lot of my paintings are people, there's people doing things and the things that are, they're doing are the things that things would make you happy if you were doing them too. Being there with your kids, being out in nature, dancing, being part of your community. For anybody who wants to be an artist, like you asked earlier, I would say do it because you, you'll have, you'll be able to experience this thing that I'm talking about, this change of perspective and seeing things in a different way. Man, it's worth its weight in gold. This is like to be able to see things differently. It's amazing. It's an amazing thing. I have a lot of stories in regard to that, you know, aside from art, but, um, you know, in a painting, you know, painting is not just a painting. A painting is some energy that's actually alive and it, it, it takes your participation. And once you get into it, it, a painting can open your mind in a way that, that you would never expect. One day you might be sitting there looking at a painting and then one day you might just go, damn, I got it. That's <laughs> what that guy was doing. And then you, you know, it was like an aha moment. And you get it and you go, Oh, it takes people a long time. This, like you look at a sculpture and you go, oh, and then you go, I get it. He, he's interested in these textures, I guess this smooth thing. And there's this, there's this dialogue between the rough surfaces and the smooth. And this is like a dance. And you know, you can walk by this thing a hundred times and never notice that. And you go, looks like a buffalo, looks like a buffalo. And then all of a sudden you see the way he does the hair and then you see the way does the eyes and then you get it it's, uh, it's not a buffalo it's really this intrigue with textures and smooth surfaces and volume and all these other things that i don't know we just you, we don't pay enough attention you know we don't pay enough attention like we're half asleep all the time i guess by the, the reference the walking dead is like most people are just like I got to get to work and I got to do this and do that and then live this life. And then the rest of us go, gee, is that what I want to do? And it's like my whole life, you know? I think that's a service that artists provide. Can they provide. Can, yeah. They can provide it. Can provide. They maybe look at the world in a different way and share that with other people by means of their artwork. It's just yeah. a matter of tapping into that and, and paying attention. You know, something about the ocean. Sometimes you go to the ocean, there's really big waves, right? If you don't know what you're doing, you see a really big wave, what do you do? You run from it. Once you get familiar with the waves of the ocean, you learn not to run away from the wave. You, people tell you, don't turn you back to a wave. What you do instead is you see a wave, you turn, face it, and you run right into it. And you, you kind of meet that wave at about the same exact speed or the impact that the wave is coming at you. And then you dive right into the face of the wave, which looks like it's gonna completely gobble you up. <laughs> but what happens is this weird phenomena happens. Boom, you bust right through the back of the wave and the wave like buses on a rock or on the sand and you come out the back of the wave and you're on calm water. You're actually just on the other side. You're actually safe. You know, the ocean has um, taught me a lot about life. Instead of running away from your problems or problems in art or, you know, can you do it? Can you make it? Can you not? They just go, man, just dive right into that dark, dark fear. And then next thing you know, you're on the other side and you go, what do I worry about? Do I dang, I got to order like 10 of these prints on the same thing, or these prints come from no place and you get orders, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, it's just like this amazing thing. And the more you um, play with it, the more amazed you get, you know? <laughs> this is like crazy. <laughs> There's a Japanese word called bonsai. There's a surfing spot called the bonsai pipeline. The way that I was told the meaning of the word was, the real meaning of the word meant 
10,000 times. And so that's really what they're shouting. 10,000 times, 10,000 times. It's because this culture knew that to get good at anything, you had to do it at least 10,000 times to really be good at it. So they call it the bonsai pipeline because for anybody to be able to ride that wave, they've had to have ridden at least 10,000 other waves to be able to even try to surf that pipeline and master it and get, get in the tube, you know? Yeah. And uh, anyway, so this, this, this thing about bonsai, doing it 10,000 times, it, it kind of means like doing your best but it also infers that to be your best, you have to do it a lot. Michael Jordan says, oh, everybody talks about all the basket balls I made. But does anybody talk about all the ones I missed? And, and when you take the combination of the ones that he missed, plus the ones that he made. And so in order to be good at anything, to be anywhere, yeah, you can have talent, you can have all that, but it's really in the the numbers, like what you actually do, except for Vermeer, you know, father light. I think he only did like he had 20 kids and like did 12 paintings in his life. There is the flute. How many paintings do you think you've painted? Okay, so let's get clear about this. As an <laughs> artist, I, I I've done paintings. That's true. But when you put the drawing, sketches, paintings sewing, all, all these things have to do with images, tile work, putting things together, a lot. You know, I won't go as far as to say I did 10,000, but how about, uh, <laughs> I did 9,900. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, <laughs> you're still close. working on it. I'm still working on it. It's probably less gotta, than that. You just gotta, yeah, I mean, you just gotta keep, keep at it. And you sell not just original paintings, but you also sell prints as well. So That's right. for people out there that maybe wish they could afford the giant original oil painting, but maybe can't do that right now, you could get a print for a few hundred dollars. -ish. You can get a small print for a few hundred dollars. Yeah, but if somebody really, really loves your work, they can do that. Mm -hmm. There are there are um, reproductions of my work, and I do them in a clay format. I actually like people to have the work. And, and I've got to say, just going back to that picture of everybody dancing on the plaza, I think we need to manifest that that that's coming back because I can't wait to to do that again. Let's dance, girl. Yes, let's dance. <laughs> Before I let you go. Okay. I'm always curious about people's favorite movies. An all-time favorite was a Fellini movie called Swept Away. Same guy that like did Harold and Maude. And I like a lot of the old like samurai movies. Mm -hmm. I like martial art movies a lot. I enjoyed and, uh, talking to you. Okay, really and appreciate it. Thank you too. We'll Let's definitely stay be in touch. touch. Yeah, for sure. Okay. All right. Have a good night. Okay. Good night. Good night.